Hey everybody, my name's Jeff and we're so excited you're here with us today. Here's a few upcoming events around the church you might wanna know about. If you drove to church and parked your car in the lot, got a cup of coffee, or walked your child into one of our children's ministries, you've already experienced some of our amazing volunteers. Getting involved on a volunteer team is one of the best ways to make Port City feel like home. We are always excited to offer opportunities for people to get plugged in and begin serving in a role they love, whether that's on a Sunday or another time during the week. If you're interested in learning more ways you can become a volunteer, swing by what's next. One of the things we know around here is that we all need to belong and to be known. Around PC3, we are passionate about forming social connections that are centered around the person of Jesus. Because of this, we place a high value on community. We learn in groups, we grow in groups, and we serve in groups. Groups can be organized around common interests, seasons of life, or to discuss biblical topics. We would love to help you become a part of Christ-centered community. So if you'd like to find out more about the groups we offer, stop by what's next after the service. Hey guys, our men's event, Relevant, is coming on Monday, March 11th at 7 p.m. down in Studio 3. Join us as we hear PC3 music director Brooks Joyce share a message about worship and what it means for that to be a lifestyle. There's no cost, but we ask that you register online under the events tab of our webpage. Thanks for being with us today. We are so excited to share our Sunday with you. What's up, five o'clock service? How are we doing tonight? Good, 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 good. Uh, my name is Carson, and I'm really, really glad uh, for our church to be together uh, tonight. This morning, our 9 and 11 o'clock services were really, really good, and I'm really excited that you are here uh, tonight. This weekend has really been a powerful weekend in the life of our house. Uh, we had a women's conference Friday night and Saturday morning. Over 700 women were in this room. Yes, it was, it was incredible. Uh, it was just a really cool time for the women of our church to be challenged in their faith and just provide them an opportunity to worship uh, God together. It was really special. Uh, something else is coming up in the life of our church next week uh, is an event for the men of our church called Relevant. Uh, and one of my really good friends, Brooks Joyce, our worship director, is going to be giving the talk that night. And I've heard his content, and it is extraordinary. Uh, he, he's going to be talking about how worship is a lifestyle, and it's something for us to pursue. Uh, and I, so I would really encourage all the men uh, in our church to be there. I'm going to be there. It really is going to be a special time for us to be together. Um, I do want to invite everybody to stand as we begin to kind of uh, worship together as a family. I want to encourage you today uh, that as we stand, we're not just standing as individuals. We're standing as a family. We're standing as a group of people that are pursuing God and trying to love Him more. And something that I love about worship is it just provides a perfect opportunity for us to take a step towards Him. And I, I learned a word a couple weeks ago, and I, I cannot pronounce it. I've not pronounced it right all day. It's a Hebrew word for praise, and I, I'm saying it as todah. And it's T-O-W-D-A-H. And it has several different meanings. One of them is just to uplift your hands in praise of your God. Another one is thanksgiving in things that are not yet um, come. Another version of the word, it talks about a choir of praise. And I I've, I've really was challenged by all three parts of the definition. Uh, but the choir of praise part really struck a chord with me because I believe that's what we do as a church week in and week out. We stand together in a room and we declare truths about our God and about us as individuals over our life. And I think that that's really special. But also the choir of praise piece, like we have a choir on stage today. And that is really something special uh, that we've got going on today because I believe Yes, uh, I believe these people are really, really dedicated people that are worshiping their creator and they're just helping to model what worship looks like. And it really is a powerful thing. So really quick, before we worship together, I would love to pray for us and pray for our time together. And then we're gonna sing about how good our God is. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for our church. Thank you for the freedom and the hope and the love that you have. God, I ask and, and plead with you that today our, our worship would not be songs, our worship would not just be words, but our worship would be powerful and a weapon that we use uh, in, in taking steps towards you. God, I pray for the person in the room today who is not sure what they believe about you. God, I pray that your love uh, would be apparent to them and they would be able to step towards you with open arms, fully confident that there's nothing that they can do to not receive the love that you have for them. So Jesus, we say all these things in your son's name, amen. Let's worship our savior together. Walk 
walking around these walls Yeah, I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me Oh, your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your Your word will 
again. What a powerful name it is. So, so, so good. He has no rival. He has no equal, which means we have freedom and hope. And that is something to celebrate in this house today. I love that line so much. It has been so powerful all day today. Uh, And you guys can just have a seat for just a second. I, I really do believe today is an extraordinary day. It's a good day. God has made today. God has put us all in the room together today. But today has a certain level of sadness. It has a certain level of of being hard that I think that we need to recognize today. It's my boss of six and a half years, last day on staff here at the church. So I'm going to invite Chris and Cindy up and uh, my uncle-in-law here. Um, (laughs) Yes, towards you. Um, I don't know if you know this, but he is my uncle-in-law because he's my wife's uncle, which makes right sense, right? Um, he, he's wanted me to call him Uncle Chris ever since I started working for him. Um, <laughs> uh, but Chris, uh, today has been an, an incredible day because we've been honoring and celebrating the person that you are and the family that you have. And I think it's been, it's been incredible for that reason, but it's also been incredible because we've been able to, to pause and to recognize your faithfulness. And I think that that's such a powerful thing. And I, I just want to speak uh, in front of our church on behalf of the team that Chris has led, honestly, since the beginning of the church, uh, that you have led so well, you've led so faithfully, you've led with love, you've let Jesus be the banner of your life and of your story. And that is just ex- something that I believe deserves to be celebrated. It deserves to be honored and you deserve our gratitude. Because you, yes. Yeah. To, to say I'm proud to know you is an understatement. And I'm, I'm, I, I, can, I think that I speak on behalf of our church when I say that. And I, I, just, I want to just you to know that you are loved, that you are appreciated. Um, and also, I think that it's fitting to recognize that our church needs to stand with you as you are taking a step into the unknown, but you're, you're, you're following after God. And I believe that God, when he meets us in that unknown place, he knows what he's getting into. He knows where you are. He knows how you feel. And I just pray that our church would be your biggest fan and we would continue to love you. We would continue to support you because God is, is, is for you. God is madly in love with you and there's nothing that's ever going to change that. So I just, I, I want you to be reminded of that. And I also think that it's fitting just for our church uh, to recognize and thank the decision that Mike and Chris made 20 years ago. I I think some of you know the story, probably a lot of you do, uh, but they took a a total step into the unknown then. You said, "Uh, we're gonna gonna start a church in Wilmington. We're gonna try to reach people and help them walk with God. And that's what you've done. You have built a place that, that displays the love of Jesus and has pushed the love of Jesus all across the world. And I believe God is actually grateful for that and honors that and rewards that. So I would love to just invite us as a church to say thank you and to celebrate the decision Mike and Chris made 20 years ago that has led to our family being what it is today. So we just celebrate and honor you in that. It's, it's hard to believe it's been uh, 20 years and it's been a day. Um, and part of what we wanted to do today, as Carson's already mentioned, is just to take the time to really publicly acknowledge and to honor. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a road, it's a, it's a hard road, it's a long road. And then when God calls us to do something um, else, something more, um, and I think that's what I hope you trust and believe in today as we're here, we want you to feel surrounded as you kind of walk into this next season. I also want you to know of my own personal gratitude to you guys, um, my love for you guys, and to let you know publicly that you know, all that you have done um, in this place, I mean, you've, you've been a part of making it who we are today, and that will continue, and there's, that will continue to be a part of who we are uh, in the future, and it will continue to be a part of your story as well. So I just want to take some time uh, today, I know we've already done that, but just to publicly honor and say thank you to Chris and Cindy and their family for all that they have sacrificed and given, and, as a, um, and just to say thank you to you guys. So thank you very much, very much. And 
You can stand back up. We're going to pray together for Chris. <clears throat> Father, we come to you right now in this moment, um, and it is a moment. It's a moment where one thing um, leads into another. And um, Father, I ask that you would just meet us in this moment and that you would um, give us such confidence in the steps that are being taken, that you would guide each one, and that in that, your faithfulness would be met um, with just tremendous joy, with um, just gratitude, with hopefulness, expectancy. And so, Father, as we do this, I pray that Chris and Cindy, Mackenzie, Caleb, Annie Grace, they will just feel surrounded as they walk into uh, this new season. We are grateful, I'm grateful, for all that you have done and are doing and will continue to do. Father, as we are about to declare, we just stand on your faithfulness and we declare that. And that's what we want to declare together as we celebrate uh, with Chris and Cindy uh, and their family today and our family today. And we lift this, Father, to the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. My blessing 
that we can rest in tonight that every single promise you made was fulfilled in Christ when he went to the cross and when he rose again. We cling to that truth. We cling to the promise that your mercy is new today. We cling to the promise that we've been saved by grace but not by our own doing. We're grateful for the promise of your presence, God, that you say you'll never leave us. God, that your Holy Spirit is a comforter. God, for that promise that we just sang that you are faithful. So grateful to be reminded of those truths tonight and to bring you glory. I pray that as we go from tonight, God, that you would continue to speak. God, you would convict our hearts. Every heart in this room, you would draw it closer to yourself. You would reveal yourself to us in a new and fresh way tonight. It's in the sweet and powerful name of Jesus that we pray and sing and worship together. Amen. Hey, thanks so much, church, for singing and worshiping with us. You can go ahead and grab a seat. I'm gonna invite our host team down now to receive the offering. I was in high school, I knew like I had a passion um, for foster kids and adoption. I have siblings that are adopted and I saw like kids um, when I was in the 10th grade get really mistreated um, in a foster home. And so that's when it like began of like, I'm gonna go do something about this. I applied to be a guardian ad litem and you had to be 18 to do it. So I applied when I was 18 um, and then I finished training right after I turned 19. So I've been doing it for two and a half years in Wilmington. 
we are the um, child's advocate in juvenile justice court um, and so we're the, essentially the child's voice in court. Um, we um, advocate um, for what's best for the child, um, we get to know kids, um, we essentially put ourselves in the child's shoes. I think like this is something like we're called to do. It's like speaking out for those who don't have a voice, like being a voice for the voiceless. It's like, this is exactly what I'm doing. Like these kids do not have a voice. They can't have a voice. This is just an opportunity for the church like to come into the justice system. And church is like where you spend your time also. Like it's not just like a Sunday thing. It's so much more than Sunday. And so for me, it's like volunteering for Guardian and Lida. Good afternoon. It's, uh, man, y'all been rowdy. You can hear y'all back in the back. It's like so loud. Um, thank you for that. It's been a, it's been a day, and uh, we are, uh, at least I'm excited about, um, you know, just what's been going on, what we're, what we're learning, and what's happening. And today, you know, I really appreciate Kaylee's story. It, it's a lot of things that she talks about in there is just how we think about taking the church, and one of the phrases she said is that the, the church is in the, the juvenile justice system. One of the things that people ask me uh, often is, um, you know, Mike, are you bothered that, you know, everybody's trying to take God out of the, you know, the, the government or all this other stuff? And, and honestly, it doesn't bother me. And the reason is because the church is in every sector of our culture, whether anybody likes it or thinks it is or not, because we're there, because we get to be there. And one of the things that has, has uh, sort of been my own journey over the years, um, it's, it's funny, if you live in church world, uh, which most of you don't, I, I do, that's because of what we do. And you talk to a lot of pastors and you talk to a lot of churches all over. And churches measure how well they're doing based on two things. And you can probably guess what they are. Whenever I go and I meet someone, they always want to know, you know, when you say, oh, you're a pastor of the church, and they'll add, the next question out of their mouth is, what do you think it is? How, how big is your church? How many people come to your church? And so churches all over America, all the time and half for the last, you know, probably 100 years, they measure their church based on two things. The first one is attendance, how many people come. Anyone wanna guess the second one? Yeah, how much money comes in? How many people came and how much did those people give? In fact, if you grew up in the church, especially the older country churches, you would see they used to have a little uh, sign up in, the, up in the, the front of the sanctuary and it would have the movable numbers it would have how many people came and how much money was there every single week. When I was growing up, they actually used to put up there how many people came, how many people read their Bibles. You have all these metrics, man. So you'd be in there, it's like 90 people came and 40 people read their Bibles. You're looking around going, who ain't reading their Bible, right? You're always trying to figure this out. And so over the years, these two things, all the organizations, every time we talk about it, people ask you, how big is your church and how much, what's your budget? How big is it? How much money's coming in? And those two numbers are sort of important but they don't tell the whole story. They just absolutely do not tell the whole story. And over the years, part of what happened in my own journey is as we were um, you know, coming into the, the, the church starting, it's all you really know. When, you, when we started this for 29, we didn't know what we were doing. You're just kind of moving and trying, you feel like God's doing something and He was, He is. And people were coming. And somewhere along the way, you sort of get into this thing where you just got to keep attracting people. And somewhere about year 10 or so, um, we realized it wasn't just about, or at least I did, maybe this was a, you know, everybody else knew this except me, but I'm sitting there and it wasn't about getting people. And it's like, oh my gosh, we got all these people. What do we do now? What do we do now? What happens to all the people that are coming? And part of this is what this, this idea is about. So you think about the church being now what the church is. It's you and I living out God's call in our lives everywhere that we are. And so part of me gets really aggressive and wants to move and wants to you know, kind of push this forward. I'm a, I'm a future guy. But what I really believe that we need to do is kind of take and hit sort of a pause button tonight. And I wanna just sort of spend some time here thinking about what the foundation of this movement really is. Because a lot of us have a picture in our head of what it is, but I don't know that it's a complete picture. I wanna sort of push on that again tonight and ask you to just do some personal introspection, some personal thinking, some personal things about where you are and how God has called you and placed you in the place where it is that you are and what it is that he's asked you to do as he's handed you the keys. Now, um, last week, uh, we talked about this idea that um, it really came from a, a Seth Godin. He's a marketing guy. He writes uh, in a secular market. He's a marketing, uh, his books were mostly in the marketing area. And he used this simple phrase that we've been using and talking about sort of in our leadership circles to think about the church. And the phrase is really simple. It's people like us do things like this. We talked about this last week. People like us do things like this. We said people like us, who we are, our identity, 
do things like this. Our culture. And I'm not talking about the culture that we live in, the culture of the world, the culture we can complain about and berate. I'm talking about the culture of who we are as God's people. People like us doing things like this. People like us doing things like this. There are, and if you weren't here last week, we talked about there are, um, there are Apple people, there are uh, Tar Heel fans, and people like us do things like this, or people like them do things like that for the Tar Heels. Everybody's okay with. And so there's this, this idea and there are all sorts of sort of subcultures when you start to think about how people interact and live their lives. People who go to Disney do things like this, right? If you know Disney people. Uh, I'm not a Disney person, I'm becoming a Disney person. In fact, um, every year I set my magic band on because every year, or at least the last couple of years, um, our gift as a family has been uh, to give uh, our tri- a trip to Disney to, to my kids. And that's what we've done the last couple of years. We give it to them in Christmas. We've gone in February a couple of weeks ago. We spent the weekend uh, at Disney World, Magic Kingdom. We went to uh, Hollywood Studios to go see Toy Story Land. Uh, we went to uh, Animal Kingdom. We rode Avatar, which is the coolest thing ever. And then we went to, um, to Magic Kingdom. And it's interesting because I was thinking about this. Whenever you sort of get there, it, it's an amazing place. And, if, and people who are Disney people, you know. Like if you just mentioned, like it's so funny, I mentioned this thing and people come up to, we're going to Disney. We've been to Disney. They, they tell you their Disney stories. There's like this, this thing that happens. People like us do things like this. They tell me all their stories, all the secrets, all the tricks, how you get fast passes, how you get that. All the things sort of happens. People, that, people like us do things like this. There's a culture of people who love Disney, people who sort of embrace the life of the magic kingdom, if you will. And so it's funny because we were there our third day in the park. We'd been two days, the third day, we had been like morning till night. We were exhausted. But the third day we go to Magic Kingdom. And Magic Kingdom is an amazing place. You stand in line, you, you, know, you, you, you do your magic band there and you get through there and you get in the line and you come out and you go into Main Street. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. You get into Main Street. When you get into Main Street, there are more people in that particular, than should ever be allowed in any place ever. It's just wall to wall with people. But somehow something is different. Somehow in this kingdom, something is fundamentally different because you'll be walking along and it's it's like literally you're walking like this and people will stop right in front of you. Do you know how annoying this is when you're walking like down the city streets and this crowd someone just stops in front of you for no reason. You like walk into him, you're like, what kind of, you know, you you kind of give them bad mouth and want to beat them up and all this stuff. Not in Magic Kingdom. People stop, people stop right in front of you and they'll look at the castle and they want to take a picture and they'll stop right in front of you. You don't run into them or push them out of the way and go, can I take the picture for you? Right? It's like something different happens when you're inside of this place place. And so there's this, there's this kingdom mindset that exists within this kingdom in which we live. In fact, we were in, a, in line for small world. Now, I don't understand this. It's a small world. It's got to be the most pointless ride on the planet. You listen to an annoying song over and you stand in line for an hour and a half to do it. But somehow in the kingdom, it is a joy to do this. We were in line for an hour and a half to sit in a boat and listen to people sing It's a Small World. And someone... <laughs> Someone broke in line. It was like, come on in. We're in the kingdom. This is all okay, right? It's a whole different way of thinking and living within this kingdom. Now, it's interesting because we've been talking about this. And this is what I want to start thinking about. We think about becoming a Christian or walking with Jesus or whatever language you give to this. We looked at this last week, this foundation for the church and how Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to read this again. If you weren't here last week, you might want to go and watch or listen to last week's talk because it will fill in some of the blanks that I'm not going to talk about today because I talked about them last week. But Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, it starts there. And he's, he, he, Jesus takes his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi. This is a place that's north of the Sea of Galilee. And he takes them up there. The reason is, I think, because there's a relatively large temple uh, to the God of Pan, which is where they believe actual physical gates of Hades existed, where this sort of God of the underworld would uh, either let loose his forces or whatever it was was in in the Greek uh, um, God system. And so he takes him up there. This is probably where it was or somewhere near there. And so Jesus takes him up there and he asks him a question. He says, what are the rumors about me? Who do people say that I am? So he's got his disciples. He says, brings him up there. He says, who do people say? What's the word on the street about me? His, his popularity had risen. His teachings had started going far and wide. People were flocking to hear him. Lots of things happened. A lot of miracles he'd done. So the, the, the word is out on this guy named Jesus. And his, he's got his disciples. He said, what's the word on the street about me? 
And they start talking, and it's interesting, we have it in like three verses. And I often wonder what it was like when Jesus said, hey, what's the word on the street? And they all start talking and chattering about all the different things. And I don't know somehow, but Matthew records, and he basically said they came up with some kind of consensus. Some people say that you're John the Baptist who was beheaded, and you sort of come back from the dead. Some say that you're the prophet Elijah who's returned. Some say that you're one of the other prophets. So there's all these kind of rumors about Jesus. I don't know what the banter was like, but it was probably kind of lively. What's the word on the street about Jesus? And they're all kind of pitching, oh, no, you know, they're, oh, I can't believe people say it looks like Jeremiah. He doesn't look anything like Jeremiah. Jeremiah's blonde or whatever, whatever it might be. And then Jesus turns and he looks at them and he says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. But what about you? Who do you say I think we'll put that up there. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered him. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, almost all of us, and you heard this last week, but almost all of us have, have heard this in some version. And we go, this is the statement. You are the Christ, the son of the living. You are the anointed one. You are the one we have waited for. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And what's happened to me is when I read this, I read ahead and I often skip this next verse. I want us to look at it really carefully. Verse 17, because Jesus replies to Peter and he says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father who's in heaven. Now I want you to pause right there, get that picture in your head. This is the first thing he says after, Jesus, after Peter makes this confession. He says, okay, wait a minute. I want you to stop right here. Blessed are you. You know, um, fulfilled are you. This, this idea of there's this, this blessing. This, I wanna stop here and pause on this because something has happened in this moment. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. He calls him by his formal Jewish lineage name. Simon, son of Jonah. Mike, son of Eddie. And he calls him by that name. And he says, flesh and blood has not revealed, to this, revealed this to you. You've not figured this out by your own thinking, but by my Father who's in heaven. That's a really important line. If you're reading this in your Bible, I would underline, but by my Father who's in heaven. Keep reading. Verse 17, or verse 18. I will, and I told you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not overcome it. I looked at this verse so many times and I tell you that you are Petros, you are Peter, you are a small stone. And on this bedrock, these two different words on this bedrock, I will build my church, my assembly, my movement and the gates of Hades shall not overcome it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Keep reading. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosened in heaven. And this is sort of the picture. I've read this verse so many times because when we were starting the church, you said, here's where he says, on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And on this rock, not only will this movement happen, but he will give us the keys. And that whatever we restrict here and whatever we permit here will be so. That's kind of what he's saying. Whatever we allow in this realm will be so. So I said, what is this rock? It's really interesting. And I looked at this last week. Put that back up there because the way this should actually read, it says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. It sounds like whatever we do here will be bound there. But the way I would actually read, if you look in your Bible, you'll see a footnote there that says this. Whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed, loosened in heaven. And he's talking about, this is a, a, a phrase that they would use for rabbis to go, what does a rabbi permit in the life of his followers? And what does he restrict in the life of his followers? That's how this would be. And for a lot of us, it's really interesting. It would be like this. See, what happens when we leave Disney World? Disney is this beautiful place. You're in the Magic Kingdom. And when you're in there, everything is as it should be. There's the happiest place on earth and everybody's experiencing the happiness that is within that place. But something happens as soon as you leave the gates and you get on the bus and you're heading back to your hotel or back to your resort or worse, back to the airport or back home. Because you know this, you get out of the park and you're ready to get home and you're now you're really tired and the magic sort of starts to fizzle away and you're standing on the bus. And if you're fortunate enough to be standing up, you're standing like this and you're bouncing along. And if you're not fortunate, if you're sitting down and someone is standing in front of you, like right in front of you and you're sitting there, you're like, can you pull your shirt down just a tad, right? This is kind of awkward. And so they're standing there. And here's what begins to happen. You begin to hear people sharing their Disney stories, their Disney experiences. And maybe you're like this. You're sitting there, they start talking about the ride. You're going, oh man, they, they didn't do it right. They'd have had a fast pass. They'd have never waited in a line that long. You start sort of berating them and, and, and condemning them because their Disney experience, Disney experience is not like yours. Your experience is far superior than theirs. And you start kind of listening and you go, oh, my mom was better than yours. My mom was better than yours. And the, more, the further you get away, the worse it gets. And when you get back here, everything is all bets are off. There is no more happiness. There is no more concern for others. If someone stops in front of you, you're going to kick them out of the way. 
And it's interesting because here's the picture of this. Whatever is allowed in the magic kingdom, for those who are dizzy, for those who wear the band, when you get on the bus, whatever has been allowed in the kingdom needs to be taken back to where I'm going. Whatever is restricted in the kingdom needs to be taken back. And somehow that begins to shift. It becomes all about me and my experience and comparing that to everybody else. This is what it's talking about. What does it look like for us to live within this place where God has, has ordered us? This is the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Thy will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. That there's a thing that has been allowed, a thing that has been permitted, a thing that has been restricted with life in the kingdom that exists there that needs to be done here. And the way it gets done is when he handed us the keys and said, I want you to live this out. That authority has been given to you. That's the picture. What we looked at last week is this idea of what we do. We start comparing our experiences to each other and to other people. If you remember this, we talked about Jesus being in the center. We gave this, this inner circle some really thin skin. We said, these are the things that are essential about Jesus. If you take any of these things away from him, he is no longer who he is. You think about his deity, you think about his authority, you think about his right as a king, his right as a son of God. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Then outside of this, you have all these things called doctrines. And these are all the things that the church has overlaid to make sure that our theology is correct. And they are important. They're important. How we steward all the different things. These are all sort of doctrinal things. And then outside of that circle, you have another circle. And we'll call this the opinions of others. And then maybe this dotted line on the outside you'll have, we call this perception. And what I want to get to is what is the foundation of the church? What is the foundation of this movement of Jesus? We've got to ask ourselves, what is the foundation? When he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. What is he talking about? What is he talking about? Because this is how you and I are going to be involved in this. What a lot of us do, right? We take this life in the kingdom. We get outside of this experience that we've had with Jesus. And we start going, oh, my experience is this. This is what I believe. We create all these paths in order for people to get to Jesus. And the church has done this. The church has done this. And what we've decided, we talked about this last week, is we want to get people to Jesus and let him define everything else. If he really is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he can handle all things for us. And here's what I want to ask you. I want to ask you two questions real quick as you think about your involvement in the church, in this church and any church and your involvement in what you believe about God. And the two things center on what it is that we permit, what it is that we restrict, what it is that we bind and what it is that gets loosened, if you will. And so I want to ask you a question. What do you think Jesus permits in his kingdom? Don't answer out loud. Just in your mind, what do you think Jesus permits? What are the things that Jesus allows people to do? Now, when I was growing up, it was like dancing, gambling. So, ooh, he would never, ever, ever allow those things. In our culture, it's a little bit different. There's a whole lot of other things. What is it you believe Jesus permits? Now, maybe here's the other thing. What is it you believe Jesus restricts? What is it you believe he forbids or doesn't allow? What do you believe he wants to change or shape or form in a place that changes what you would normally think about something? What are the things that you think Jesus allows and what are the things that you think Jesus restricts? Here's what you can find. You can find churches that will serve any of those purposes. You can find churches that will allow the same things that you allow and that restrict the same things you restrict. And here's the problem. What this is, this is a fear-based thinking. It's actually unfaithfulness to Jesus. It's not trusting him enough to do his work in the lives of the people that he has saved. And I'll tell you, I've struggled with this because I'll tell you what's easier. It's easier to create a whole bunch of things that we're clear on and we all believe the same things and the only people who come and show up in here are the people who believe just like us and think just like us. That would be the easiest way to do this. In fact, a lot of people do it. What we've decided is that we're gonna trust and we're gonna try to get people to Jesus and let him define everything else. You see, here's the problem. If you're sitting here, the odds are, if you sort of feel this like, oh my gosh, where's Mike going? When you're afraid of what are the things that Jesus uh, restricts, you're going to think that Jesus will tolerate more than you will. You think that somehow Jesus will be okay with things that you're not okay with. I can't believe they let them wear hair like that or tattoos or this or that or the other. If they really love Jesus, they wouldn't allow this. We have all these lists of things. And what we are afraid of is that Jesus is gonna permit more things than we would. And on the other side of that is the exact opposite coin. Is some of you are afraid that Jesus might restrict things that you would never in a million years restrict. You think it'd be okay to do this, 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 and this, and what's wrong with it anyway if this is, you know, we have all these reasons for it. And you're afraid that Jesus might actually restrict that. And here's what I'll tell you. He does. He restricts anything 
that keeps your identity from being central on who he is and what he has done and life in his kingdom. Whatever you bind here will have already been bound. You're going to be reflecting the kingdom of heaven right where you are. As you sit on the bus, as you get back to your hotel, as you get on the airplane, as you go to work, all those pieces are who you're gonna be. It's so funny. One of our staff members, her name is Lauren, and she's a true Disney person, true Disney person. And whenever people tell me they're going to Disney, and this has been happening all day, they say, hey, we're going to Disney in two weeks. I'm like, oh man, I can't believe you're going. I'm like jealous, I wanna go. And I wanna tell them like, my Disney experience was better than your Disney experience because I'm a better Disney person than you are, right? You, you feel like you wanna do that, not Lauren. When I told Lauren I was going to Disney with our family, she said, I am so excited for you. In fact, I wanna help you get the best experience you can out of your trip. I'm like, really? And she wanted to help me. She wanted me to enjoy. She wanted me to experience the joy that she had experienced and knew was possible and available for me. Do you see how different that is? A lot of us wanna make sure that people believe the right things about us. What has Jesus done for you that causes you to want other people to experience that freedom that you've experienced? That's what you gotta get to. See, I'm a Disney person, but I'm not like I ought to be yet. I'm getting there. I'm gonna continue to grow. And it's the same thing with being a follower of Christ. We're not yet who we are, but he has handed us the keys. This is really important in terms of how we live this out and walk this out in our daily lives. The thing that was interesting to me in this passage, the rock, the foundation upon which we build, is really interesting. I was reading this, this article this past week, I've never seen this before. I've studied this passage a gajillion times. I've never noticed this. And it was kind of a, this is how God works in my life sometimes. I'll kind of get this idea or this, this, this idea or this light bulb moment. And this happened to me in the previous series. And we were talking about what it is that Jesus did for us. And we said that Jesus reconciles us to the Father because that's where we get our identity from. Our identity derives from the Father. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said, and no one comes to the Father but through me. He reconciled us in a relationship with the Father. It's interesting that when Jesus talks to Simon, he addresses his lineage. Simon, blessed are you. Simon, son of Jonah. That's an important relationship, but I want you to know that's not the most important relationship because that's not what revealed to you this foundation upon which I'm gonna build my movement, my church upon. Instead, he says that my Father who is in heaven is the one who revealed that to you. It was given to you by my father. And it's the tale of these two fathers. I also didn't begin to see this, the whole way in which Jesus came, the whole way in which he is presented to us. When Jesus came to save, to, when God decided to build his people and his kingdom here on this earth, he didn't send us a prophet. He didn't send us a political leader. He didn't send us a warrior. He sent us, you know what it says? John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Do you know when you read through the New Testament, you know what you'll see? That he took his son in order to make a way for many sons. That's Hebrews chapter two. He gave his son in order to make a way for many sons. He gave his only child in order to make a way for many, many children. He called us to come and to be underneath his sonship. He invites us to pray, our Father who is in heaven. Do you realize if kids who aren't your kids come up to you and call you dad, that's kind of weird. That's exactly what Jesus invited us to do. He said, I want you to pray the same way I do. I want you to have the same relationship with my father that I do. I want you to understand that you are a part of him. You are sons and you are daughters of God when you live inside of my kingdom. That's the whole point. Everything is reiterated in this. The way Jesus was presented to us in John chapter 14, he came into his own and his own did not receive him. But to all who would receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. John chapter three, or first John chapter three, beloved, uh, behold what manner of love has been lavished upon us that we should be called the children of God for such we are. It is his sonship that pays the way for our connection to the Father. I've never seen this before. It's mentioned almost every time in all these big moments when Jesus was baptized. John the Baptist baptized him, he comes up out of the water, the heavens open up, the dove comes down, and what does the voice of the Father say? Now this is a guy with great character, this is a guy whose mission, he says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Jesus takes three of his disciples up onto the mountain and he reveals some things about himself. It's called the transfiguration. This is in Matthew chapter, I think uh, 17, 15, uh, Matthew chapter 17. And he takes them up there and he transforms into this lightning white image and Peter and James and John are blown away. And as this sort of dissipates and only Jesus remains, the heavens open up and the voice of the God comes again. It says, this is my 
son. Well, that was really important. I've always believed that this confession that Jesus um, is the, the uh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, was the confession upon which the church is built. But I don't think that's the foundation upon which the movement of Jesus continues. Is it important? Yes, it's important. It's critically important. But here's what's interesting. I think all the other disciples, or at least arguably several of them, already believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what you see in the early days when they started following Jesus. That we have found the one, the anointed one. We have found the Messiah. They already believe it. So what's unique about this? What's the foundation upon which God is going to build his church? Here's what it is. The foundation upon which God is going to build his church, the foundation of the movement of Jesus is not our beliefs. It's our relationship. The movement of Jesus, the foundation of the movement of Jesus is the fact that we have been reconciled to the Father. It's we belong to him. That's the foundation. And let me tell you how this works in our life and your life. It's interesting, C.S. Lewis talks about this. He talks about, he writes about this in a book called Mere Christianity. And he says, when he's, when he's using this phrase, our Father, when Jesus invites us to say, our Father who's in heaven, we are making ourselves like Him and we walk with Him and we live with Him such that He, we, we actually catch what He has. And we become infected by his life. That's the phrase he uses. And this is a good time to talk about this, right? It's flu season. We all love this time of year when people try to shake your hand or give you a big old hug. You're like, oh my gosh. People come to me, I've been snotty all day, so you don't want to shake my hand after the service. But you'll come and you'll give me an elbow bump. And some of you won't even touch. You'll just, you'll miss me with this much because you don't want to get what I've got. And what Jesus has done is invite us to the opposite. We want to be so close to him that we catch everything that he has. That's how C.S. Lewis talks about this. He injects in us his life because we walk so close with him. And it's interesting, Paul talks about this in the book of Romans. And really the whole book is really trying to convince us that this, this, these, this, this getting it right in our beliefs is not enough. Believing the right things is not enough. Everybody can, it's, it's learning how to live in a relationship with Jesus that reconciles us to the Father. To live out this identity in who he has made us to be. And here's where he talks about this in Romans chapter 10. He starts off and he says, do not say in your heart, do not say in your heart, who will bring uh, down heaven or who will descend into the deep? He's, he's talking about this idea of don't sit there and say in your heart and try to figure out how this is going to work. Don't try to figure out how you're going to understand this. Do you know why? Because flesh and blood doesn't reveal, is not revealed by our thinking by flesh and blood. He says instead, I want to put this on the screen and look at this. He says, I want you to, this is what you say in your heart, but what does the word say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart. This is not about sitting down and trying to contemplate how this works. This is sitting down and trying to listen to what is already being spoken to you. I want you to hear me really, really carefully. Because I talk to enough people to know that most of the time when we're arguing about points, we're usually trying to justify things that we already believe. And we're trying to justify behaviors that we've already done. And so we stop listening and start trying to figure things out. And he says, I want you to listen in your heart. The word is near you. It has already been spoken to you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart. That is the message concerning the faith that we proclaim. And look at what he says next. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is a little different than what a lot of us have heard. It's talking about getting us to a point where you sit down with the whispers in your own heart and your own soul, not what you think intellectually about what Jesus did or didn't do. When you sit down and you listen to the word that has already been spoken to you, what God has already said to you. And some of you know, even if you try to go, I don't really believe in that, I don't think that you know, when you lay at night, there's this still small whisper that you can't get away from. That's what I want you to listen to. That's what I want you to hear. That's what he's asking. He's like, don't say in your heart, let me try to figure this out or rationalize this or do this. I want you to listen in your heart. I want you to hear what he is saying because you have been made by him and for him and he is calling you to himself. He says, whoever says with their mouth, Jesus is Lord. And here's how I've practiced this in my life. This isn't just the one-time thing when you come to him as a, as a follower of Christ and you sort of enter into that relationship and you get your magic man in the beginning. This is how you become along the way to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. I put this in my journal over and over again. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I want to confess this over and over again. And you know what I realize? There are places in my life where he's not Lord. 
There are thought patterns. There are things that I hold on to and go, God, you know, I'm going to hold on to this because eventually this is going to serve me really well. And he's asking us, do we trust him enough to make him Lord of every single part of your life? And here's this is so important. I love, I'm going to close with, with, with this. Basically what happens is it helps me to listen. It helps me be attentive. It helps me be willing. And here's how you're going to understand Jesus as the center. It's when you allow, you meet Jesus in the center, when you allow him to meet you in your center. The place where you know that whisper is, the place where you know those questions are, the place where you know those inadequacies reside, the place where you know that those sort of secret sins, the fear, the anxiety, where those things kind of hide to listen to him there and to make those declarations, Jesus is Lord, you will be set free. It's what he does. Most of us don't experience this because we spend so much of our time trying to figure out how we're supposed to work or how how we're, we're supposed to do or how this is gonna work instead of just trusting the king to let his kingdom come to bear on our lives right where we are. I thought about this because people are always asking, Mike, how's the church? And I'll do it and tell you, the numbers are fine. The two big numbers, they're fine. I'm not really concerned about that. One of the things I've been saying for years, and I believe this to be true, that a church is not measured by how many people attend, that a church, a successful church, should be measured by its impact, by the difference that we make in the world around us. That's what Jesus has actually invited us to do. He's not called you to become moral so you can live a nice moral life here in the United States of America. He has handed you the keys. And he said, I want you to bring the kingdom to bear on the world in which you live. How's the church doing? How do we do when we build on this foundation that we belong to the Father? People ask me all the time, Mike, what's the key to marriage? I do a lot of weddings, been married a long time. Um, I enjoy being married a whole lot. Um, I hope my wife enjoys it as much as I do. I think she's probably easier to live with than I am, but it works out pretty well. People ask me all the time, Mike, what's the key to marriage? Is it just you say yes to her? You know, just say yes, yes, dear. I'm like some kind of knucklehead and stuff like that. People always say stuff like that. But years ago, I began to realize this, and I believe this, and I say this at every wedding. If you want to know what the secret to marriage is, it's really simple. As your walk with Christ goes, so goes your marriage. It's really that simple. If I can wake up in the morning and I walk with Jesus in such a way that I receive his love and trust his love and allow him to be my satisfaction, allow him to bring fullness into my life, what it does is it frees me from demanding it from the people closest to me. When you learn how to do that, you're actually free to give of yourself to other people in a way that actually makes a difference. And it's as your walk goes, so goes your marriage. And what I would submit to you today is when it comes to thinking about your church, our church, as your walk goes, so goes your church. He said, here are the keys. Here are the keys. See, the church is now. The church is everywhere you go. And when he handed you the keys, the only way that you can handle those keys well is to listen to him and to trust him. That happens in the whispers down here in the depths of who you are. I want you to hear what he's saying. The word has already been spoken. It is in your heart. It is on your mouth. If we declare with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God has raised him to life, we will walk in the fullness of that. C.S. Lewis, and this is hard. C.S. Lewis finishes um, with this statement and this is what I wanna kind of leave us with tonight. Because I want to give you this picture. The foundation of the church isn't the right beliefs. Right beliefs are insanely important. Don't get me wrong. They're insanely important. But the foundation of the church is for you and I to live as reconciled children of the Father. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. It is by listening to the whisper of God's voice and his call on your life in every single moment. He's handed you the keys and he wants you to use them according to the purposes that he's established. C.S. Lewis finishes this segment talking about this injection and catching the life of Jesus. And he says it like this, we'll put it on the screen. The real son of God, the real son of God is at your side. He's beginning to turn you into the same kind of thing as himself. He's beginning, so to speak, to inject his kind of life and thought. The word is zoe, his life, his zoe. This is uncreated, original, intended life from the beginning. He's injecting that into you and into me. He's beginning to turn the tin soldier into a living man. 
Anybody ever feel like that? He's beginning to, to do something in you. He's changing you from one thing into another, this tin soldier into a living man. And here's what he says at the end, I love this. He says, the part of you that does not like it is the part of you that is still tin. Anybody got a little tin left in them? Just a little bit, maybe just a smidge. That's the part. See right here, when, I, when you read that, you know there are parts of you that you are holding back, that you've, you're comfortable enough or you're free enough or whatever it is that you don't really need him to touch. And those are the places, if we're gonna learn how to handle the keys well, it's when we allow him to take those places and we come to him and say, Jesus, you're gonna be my king. And you're gonna have the authority, we've been talking about this, but you're gonna have the authority in my life to do whatever it is because whatever you permit, I'll permit. Whatever you restrict, I'll restrict. Whatever happens where you have your will and your rule and your way will happen in my life right here, right now. And y'all, that is how the kingdom is done here on earth as it is in heaven. And he's handed you and I the keys and said, hey, let's go make that happen. And it only happens when you learn how to walk with him. So here's your homework for this week. So there's still some tin left in you. And the answer to that is yes. <laughs> what is it? And what are you gonna allow for him? Because those are the places you're gonna start to see what gets allowed, what gets restricted. And when those two things come under submission to him, you will learn how to live free. And y'all, that is what our world is looking for. They need the hope of the gospel. We've been handed the keys to bring that hope to the gospel. And I want for us to leverage this well. And there are a gajillion opportunities all around us every single day. Let's pray together. Father, I ask you to help us. We get so comfortable with our 10 lives and sort of doing certain things. And we get comfortable with the change that you have brought. Some of it's even radical change. And we've gotten this to a point. And Father, I ask we won't stop there. We won't stop until every single part of our thoughts, of our lives, of our actions, of our hearts, of our souls are submitted to your Lordship. That whatever you bind in your rule will be bound in our lives. And whatever you permit in your rule will be permitted in our lives that we might bring the hope of your children to all the world that was made to be that way. Father, just use us to that end. Speak to us, help us, let us listen to the word that has already been spoken, that we might confess you as our Lord. And I ask the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.